start. So it's my pleasure to um, give a warm welcome to Dr. Claudia Matta to start our 2016 Rehab Science Seminar Series this year. Um, Claudia is originally from Rome in Italy and completed her PhD in bioengineering at the University of Bologna. Her postdoc studies then went on to be completed at the University of Rome. Luckily for us, Claudia has recently moved over to the UK to take up a position as lecturer at the Department of Mechanical Engineering in Sheffield. Her work is focused around human movement analysis, particularly gait and the various methods by which it's assessed and modelled. Aptly today, her talk is entitled Human Gait, Measuring the, pos measuring the Possible and Modelling the Impossible. So, without further ado. Thank you. But first of all, let me thank you and Lynn and Alan for the invitation today, which was really uh, a pleasure for me since I've, I've been starting doing some work uh, together with Lynn, Brooke and, and all the, uh, Sylvia and all the others. And it's, it's the more we go on and the more I'm excited about it. So really, thank you for inviting me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, is probably slightly different from the kind of things that we do with them because I just thought would be silly to talk about the same thing that they know much better than I do. So I decided to focus on the, on the a little bit more on the other half of the story. And in general, um, I'm going to try to present to you uh, the different techniques and different approaches that we use when we have to deal with measuring and modeling movement in different contexts. Um, the reason for this funny title was just simply that we were exchanging emails with Alan and I couldn't come out with a, with a, with a funny, uh, I needed, to, I felt like I needed to come out with something funny so I just said this and he said okay we'll take it so <laughs> let's see. Uh, so this is what we deal with, we look at movement, we, th this can happen in every, uh, every sort of forms and it's something that many scientists have been looking at in, uh, throughout the, throughout uh, the ages and I, I'm in an, an engineer's background, so the way I look at this is normally trying to find numbers to associate to it, try to describe it, quantify, to measure it. And, and possibly what we try to do is to do it in, in, a, in a simple way, in a straightforward way. And we wish we could always do this. Sometimes things are a bit too complicated, but we still try. And so this is how everything started. Normally, whenever you go to one of these talks about human movement, this is always the, our uh, first reference. Uh, is, and of course, there is some patriotism here. It's uh, the work from Leonardo da Vinci, who was probably the first one that started looking into trying to somehow model and describe very simply, very linearly, uh, what happens to the center of mass when we are just standing or when we start moving and stepping in place or forward. And similarly, mm, someone else, a few cent a couple of centuries later, is uh, again another Italian, Borrelli, who started building slightly more complicated models in order to describe what happens when that, uh, when a limb or when a body is subjected to the, to the force of, of, for example, of this big mass here. And he's the first one that started thinking about the idea of using physics and mathematics in order to really describe the phenomena that he was observing. And then this guy came, came into, the, into the game who was the first person that started telling us it's not enough to just look at the movement. At some point we are not able to quantify everything we need, either because we cannot really see it, because we don't have lenses that are big enough, or because whatever we are trying to, uh, to, to look, it's too fast, or simply we cannot access the information. Uh, we, we, need, we need to quantify the information that we need in order to be able to do some reasoning further. So, He's the first one that started measuring movement, and this is how he, he was doing it. So basically, some what we call today the wearable sensors, which he was using in order to describe the gait cycle and describe the movement of the of the of the vertex of the head as a result of the movement of the lower limb. Uh, of course, you know better than me because you have one lab next door that things are a bit different today. So these are the kind of measurements that we do in a standard uh, uh, movement analysis lab, where we have uh, typical the motion capture system that we use to uh, measure the movement of points that we place on the skin of the subjects, that are, uh, which we call markers. And 
uh, then we associate these measurements, the, the measurements of the forces that we exchange with the environment, either to force plates or to pressure maps or, or <coughs> pressure insults, and then we try to to measure, we measure the activity of the muscles that is associated to, this, to these movements. The reason why we do this is, uh, are, 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 are different. There are a number of objectives that we can think of when we start measuring something in the gate lab. So the first, the most straightforward, is the, the one of describing the movement of the skeleton in space. And this is how, basically, we, we, we associate the bones to the movement of the markers, and we just try to describe what's happening. Um, this, then the next step is, as I said before, we always have this obsession of putting numbers next to the, next to the visual. So this is uh, what we extract from, from, those, from those measurements. We take a gait cycle, and we, and we uh, describe the movement, not just of the skeleton in space, but what happens to uh, adjacent segments, and we call that the joint kinematics. So basically we tell how much, for example, this is the flexion of the knee during a gait cycle, so how much is our knee flexing while in order to allow, the, allow us to step forward. So, and, again, and, and then we can apply this same uh, approach to different experimental setups. So in these graphs, for example, you see the effect of asking someone to just walk in faster and faster and how the, 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 the joint kinematics changes as a result. So each of these patterns represent uh, a subject going from a very slow walking to a very fast walking, for example. And this can be already informative enough, but there, are some, uh, there is one thing that we need to keep in mind, is the fact that the only thing that we measured were some markers on the skin. This means that these bones that you see here are just a visualization of our phenomena. These are just a database that is attached to every single representation of human movement by simply scaling those bones to the shape of the person using the markers that we've put on the skin. And this is an information that can be enough for, for many of the applications, but if we think of problems like this one, for example, when we have a patient that has some, some bone deformities, some important bone deformities, in this case, this is a patient with osteoarthritis that is completely affecting the one of the knees, whereas uh, what we observe in the contralateral side is completely different. So using the same bone to represent what happens to that joint might be very limiting, might not be informative enough. For this reason, sometimes we really need to have not just the movement, but also a, a proper description, a proper model of the anatomy of that subject. And this is why we go even more complicated than a simple gate lab, and we start using images. These are all the possible sources of imaging that we can use in order to obtain uh, an, a numerical description of the shape of the bone of a person. Uh, so either starting from magnetic resonance, from more invasive techniques such as the computer tomography, or even in dynamic condition like with the MRI or the, CT or the fluoroscopy here. So no matter how we, how we measure that, the, the good news is that we can obtain a model, a representation of, of the geometry of our subject that is really the one of the subjects that we have in the lab in that moment. And the idea is that we can join the two informations. The way we do it is by uh, what we call the registration between the gate analysis data and the imaging data. And the way we do this is by simply putting some markers that are visible in both modalities. So we have our subject performing the gate analysis then we take the same markers that we were visible in the gate analysis and we make sure that they're visible also in the, in the imaging scan so that we can put the two information together. And this time what we obtain is, a patient's, is an anatomical model that is really representing the patient that we are interested in, in, uh, in, in, in studying, in assessing. So the joint kinematics that we obtain at that stage are really my patient joint kinematics rather than being just generic ones. And this is very useful also to compensate for all the errors that are very well known to affect traditional gait analysis, such as the fact that when we place the markers, we think that we are putting them in, correspond in, in the right place with respect to certain, uh, certain anatomical points, which, we, which most of the time is a very 
uh, is, is a procedure that brings in a lot of errors, a lot of inaccuracies. And it's been shown in different contexts that using the patient-specific anatomy might significantly improve the, the, the result of this, of this uh, operation. <coughs> the, once we have a perfect description of how, of how our joint moves, of how our bone moves, what we really want to do is also to understand how we are using our muscles in order to control and produce that movement. So we are interested in solving what we call the problem of the joint kinetics. And to do this, that's when we start looking at the, you see these green arrows that appear in the video when the person is walking. Those are the external forces that we are exchanging with the ground. So when we start, uh, at, at this point, the question is trying to understand which are the, the moments, which is the mechanical action that we are producing with our muscles around the joints in order to compensate for the fact that we have a force that is pushing under the foot. So again, we, we use some mechanical uh, description of the phenomenon and what we obtain is, is another series of graphs that, tell, that are able to tell us whether we are, for example, using the muscle, the flexor muscles rather than the extensors muscles around, the, around a, a certain joint in order to be able to, to keep walking, to keep moving. So this is what, what I would call the, the third objective. But of course, again, this is, is good, is informative, but sometimes you want to know even more. So I'm not just interested in knowing whether I manage or not to, and how and when I manage to flex my, my knee, but I want to know exactly which muscles I'm using and which is the force that I'm producing. And this is something that we would be very happy to be able to measure, but this would mean cutting a muscles, putting a dynamometer in, sewing everything back and asking our patients to walk. And you can imagine that this is not, uh, this is not really feasible. So once again, we can't measure, so what we, but the only thing that we can do is try to model what we observe and try to get an answer to that. So we want to go from knowing this quantity that tells us just one information around, around the joint and translate that information in terms of the, the action exerted by each muscle and the interaction between bones that are causing that overall effect. In order to solve this problem, we have, we, as usual, we go back in time and ask uh, help to people that know how to do things. The first person is, is at Newton who gave us the, uh, the definition of the, uh, the mechanical laws that generate that, that rule the interaction between these forces. And then normally we, but as you can see, we have a, num, a series of information and we only have two equations that we can use, which means that we need other sources of information. The most typical one is to use the electromyography, so the other quantities that we have measured, or to use the, some, some knowledge about the physiology of the muscles, like the one that is coming from, from the heel laws, for example, that describe the mechanism of excitation and contraction of the muscles. So we tr again, what we try to do is to transform this physiological knowledge into some equations, into some numbers that we can use. The problem is that at the moment, we don't know enough about our system. So everything we can do in order to solve this problem is to guess, to guess which are the strategies that we put into play when we want to perform a movement. So the most common hypothesis, for example, is that no matter what we do, we try to minimize energy, both in terms of overall mechanical energy or energy associated to the muscle contraction. And this is what it's normally implemented into the softwares that allow us to, do the net, to, 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 to solve this problem. So we take, again, our, now we have our model. We have already seen how we, we can calculate the joint kinematics. We add the measurement of the ground reaction force, and then we try to, again, to solve the, the problem of understanding what's happening, which muscles are working, by using some physiological uh, concepts. And this is what is normally implemented in, in all the muscle skeletal solver packages. The, the one I'm showing here, OpenSIM, is the one that we use because it's an open source uh, software that is available to the, to the community, but there are a number of possible solutions. The concept is always that they, they have the, the, mat the mathematics in place in order to allow us to, trans to uh, implement every possible physiological idea that we have in mind in terms of 
how our muscles work in order to produce a movement. A movement. And this is what we, we obtain as a result of all that process. So we have a description of our uh, lower limb in this case that is, this, uh, that is uh, a very, uh, well, very, maybe not, but a quite accurate uh, representation of the, of the anatomy of the subject. And we then associate the information that comes from the gate lab. And we, as you can see here, you see that these muscles change, these lines that represent our muscles change color while the person is walking. That is telling us that a mus when a muscle is active, when a muscle is contributing in order to produce the movement. Uh, and of course, besides knowing when a muscle is, is, is active, we can also know how, how strong is, is pulling in order to, to generate the movement. And again, the, the overall result of this is uh, the estimate of the forces that, are, that as a consequence are exchanged between the bones, are exchanged internally to the joint. Which, so all this mess that we have done, measuring gait, measuring images, measuring the anatomy, putting all the information together, in the end, this is the result that we are looking for. These little arrows that act on the, on the femoral head, which, and the reason why we are so interested in this is because this, this force, this joint load, can cause, a little ch uh, can cause a number of changes into the bone. So if you think about um, a weak bone, an osteoporotic bone, for example, the action of that force might even cause a damage at some point in time. So if we are interested in knowing how our bone reacts during the walking, this is all the process that we have to go to. And even further, we can use another level of modeling that is what is the, called the finite element modeling approach, where we try to understand how this force applied here in this point of the bone then propagates and distributes overall uh, through the entire bone uh, structure and surface. And of course, if we observe a number of different movements, we obtain a number of different forces, and this will generate a number of different responses from our bone. So not only we need to model gait, but most of the times we need to model a number of series of tasks in order to be able to really understand what's happening, uh, what's happening to someone when, when they are uh, living their normal life, their daily life. And the reason why we do all this is because we don't want only to measure what happens, but you, we also aim at predicting what will happen to that person at some point. And this is an example of how those models, exactly that application that I've just shown you, has been used, for example, to predict the risk of fracture of, of women with osteoporosis. This is a typical way of uh, the result of, the result of a, a statistical analysis aiming at, predict, uh, at classifying patients as uh, potential <coughs> patients with who underwent a fracture against patients who, under, who, who didn't undergo a fracture. And normally what happens is that this is a probabilistic representation where if you have something that happens randomly, you would find a curve here that instead of being this nice lovely red curve would just be a diagonal giving you a value of 0.5. If you have an accuracy of 0.89, like in this case, it means that basically 90% of the times you are predicting the right thing. And we have shown that uh, it's possible to do this prediction with a much level, uh, higher level of accuracy using our modeling approach rather than using what is the clinical standard practice, which is simply measuring the, uh, the bone mass density using DEXA scans, for example. So this justifies for us that it, for us it's a very good reason to, to do all that mass. Of course, this is not what we always need. So there are, there are a number of other applications where all this is unfeasible and useless, probably. And these are applications where we really need to monitor our patients more often, or we need to monitor our patients outside the clinics. Uh, for example, if we want to associate to, to, to that model that we saw before, the, the probability of having uh, dramatic events, such as a fall, we can't really do anything inside the lab. We really need to, to see what happens in, in when the patient leaves. And if we want to, fo to follow uh, patients like the patients that you see here, uh, like patients with Parkinson's disease, 
we are more interested in, in measuring things more often rather than just looking at them uh, once in time like we did we normally do in a gate lab. So and this is when the when wearable sensors come into play. Uh, so no matter if we need to, to do this type of assessments, we can't still rely on the gate lab. We really need to find something different. Um, so let's start I would like to give you a few examples of the kind of work that we are doing with wearable sensors in the clinics at the moment. So referring to, to problems where we really cannot bring the gate lab into the game, even if we would, we would love to, but it's really just not feasible. Uh, so normally what we do is just, this is like a very standard way of using these sensors. You just put them on the patient and you ask them to do some predefined tests in the lab which is what has always been done without sensors for ages. And now finally we are able to, to, to provide some, some objective measurements associated to them. So like in this case, we ask, we ask this patient to just perform what is the so-called time up and go test. So just rise from the chair, walk, come back and sit down again. And as you can see, normally sensors are placed all over the place on the body of the, of the patient. Uh, these sensors, so the one you saw in this picture, are just like an example. Of course, there are plenty of different kinds. These are those that are able to measure uh, uh, three different kinds of information. The acceleration, that is what describes you, basically all the, the, the movement that, that happens uh, in association to a linear displacement. So if I just do this, for example, I'm doing a translational uh, movement, I'm, I'm imposing a translational <coughs> movement to, my, uh, to this object, and, and I can measure the acceleration, the linear acceleration associated to that movement. And normally we do it with, uh, look, by looking at all the, all the possible direction of movements. Then we associate to those some angular velocity sensors, which are able to measure these other kind of movements, so the rotational movements, so they are complementary. And then we have some other sensors that allow us to put all this information together and get an estimate also of the angles that, the, and the variation of the orientations of our objects. And of course, if we, if we are observing someone moving or someone uh, even just standing, the signals that we can record at the different parts of the body are completely different. So, if you ask someone to walk and you measure the, the you, use, you put the sensors at the ankles, you would see these kind of shapes in your signals. If you put the sensors on the, on the, on the waist, you would see completely different shapes. And of course, depending on, on the kind of, uh, on the applications, some of them might be more informative or some of them might be less informative. Um, so there, have, there has been plenty of, of literature and of work that has been done in terms of detecting, for example, the, the, the basic uh, uh, gate features, which is simply telling uh, which are the, gate, the, um, the spatial temporal parameters as, uh, of gate. So telling us how, how far a person is going, how long, uh, how fast a person is walking, which is the, 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 the how much each, each step is, is lasting. And this requires recognizing a certain number of events on, on, on those signals that I showed you before. And it's been, there's plenty of, let, of literature that show that this can be done accurately, it's a problem that has been solved, but this is only true. I mean, we can be really 100% confident when we deal with healthy <coughs> adult that works in a, in, a, in a very controlled condition. As soon as we start looking at patient data, we can't expect to use, this, this is an example of data co collected from four different uh, patients having four different conditions, and you can see how this signal has nothing to do with this signal, even the, if they were both walking. So whatever has been developed, tested, and validated on healthy subjects will most likely not work when we deal with this kind of, 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 of application. So it really needs to be uh, to be treated with care. So most of the problem is that most of the, of the, <coughs> there are some, some, some commercially available systems that, that are sold that tell, oh yeah, you can do this assessment in the clinics in a very controlled situation and for sure everything will work. And then you start using them on your patients and you realize that they are not working. And this is the reason why. So you're lucky enough to be part of, of, of to be in a place where these things are very well known and are taken care 
every day, but there, there are plenty of papers out there in the literature that provide results which are based on systems that have never been validated and are just blindly used to do these kind of things. And it's, it's quite depressing when you try to replicate the results in your lab and you obtain something completely different, and this is just a simple reason why. Well, simple. <laughs> um, the other thing that we have started doing in, in, our, uh, in collaboration with, with, with Lean, but also like something that we have been doing in the past before, is looking at the, at the behavior of the upper body during walking. Since when the, the inertial sensors are around, this is something that has been received, receiving more and more attention, simply because now we are, we are able to measure things that we were not able to measure before. So it's possible to just stick sensors around the body and get some data out of them. So there have been plenty of, uh, inst of parameters that have been proposed, that have been suggested by different groups uh, for, for getting something out of these signals. And it's quite interesting, again, to see how many of these parameters are just used uh, uh, differently on different populations and are bringing different results. And some of the work that we are doing at the moment is really trying to understand which of these makes sense and which of these make not, does not make sense and for which populations. But, so in general, this is an example of what we have been doing together. It's using the, by looking at the accelerations of the upper bodies and trying to use this, this, uh, this information in order to discriminate and classify between different patient populations. I won't go into the details of this, but it's just to give you an idea. Uh, another kind of application that we are working on at the moment, still be something that we were able to develop thanks to the fact that we can finally do measurements in, in, in a clinical environment rather than uh, in, in a using with wearable sensors rather than using motion, a motion capture system, is that we have, we have started looking at the uh, uh, at quantifying the, the um, the, the movement of the neck in patients with, uh, with motor neuron disease. The reason for this is that these patients have a, a normally suffer of muscle weakness and, and one of the main problems that they have is the fact that they, they at some point they start losing control of their head, which means that they have a, a massive issues with their head drop, which limits their ability to, to interact with, the pe to, with other people, but also to, to drink, to eat, to, to perform normal daily activities. So one of the questions that we had from our clinicians was, uh, we have a solution in mind, we would like to be able to quantify whether this solution could work or not. Can you help us in devising a way of measuring this, the, the, the residual movement that these patients have so that we can, we can then use it to assess, to test the intervention that we, that we have in mind. So we started looking, this is an example of just one movement, but we, we looked at a series of movements. And this is what we, if we place a sensor on the, on the head and one on the, on the, on the sternum, and we start looking at uh, how our signals change when we ask someone to, this is simply asking someone to, to extend their neck. So it's a very simple controlled movement, just sitting there and doing this. So this is if you ask uh, a, a, one of our control patients to, uh, to perform that movement, this is the kind of acceleration that you measure. And this is what happens in a patient with MND, so with, with difficulties in controlling the, the neck muscles at that stage of the, of the pathology. And you can see here that this is a kind of movement that has never been tested in these patients, despite the fact that everybody keeps reporting that is an issue with these patients. So far, there is no literature. If you try to find any information about this, you can't really find much. So we, we just started really looking into what is changing, what is causing this, uh, wh what are the, quant the consequences of this weakness. So as I was saying, you can see here that well, the accelerations are, are slightly lower, but this is not really the point because I mean, we're asking to do a movement that is mainly a, a, a rotational movement, so I wouldn't expect much changes in the accelerations. But what is interesting is that you can see how the shape is these signals is becoming more irregular, more, it's, which for us is, indi is an indicator of the fact that they are having problems in being more fluid in performing their movement. So we came out with a, a typical parameter that is used in other applications to measure this kind of irregularity in the signal, which is what we call the, which is, is called the normalized jerk. Then we looked at the angular velocities 
and two things emerges clearly. One is that, again, the signal is, is, is lower, which means that the movement is, is lower. But the other interesting thing is that, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, we're asking our subject to simply do this movement. So in theory, we should only see things changing for one of these signals, like it happens for our control subjects. But if you lose control, if, you have, if your muscles are weak and you lose control of your movement, normally what you do is try to compensate using whatever else you have, you have available. And this is what you see here. So the movement is not happening along just one direction anymore. But even if the subject is really trying to do that, we, we see that there is something else happening here. So we, we, we define this, this number, which we call the couple movements ratio. So basically, it's a way to try to say, are you just doing using one direction, or are you mix, mixing the three of them? Um, so we have tried to, to use these parameters, and we saw that these are very good, very good especially the last one, are discriminating between age match control and patients with, with an NMD. So this is like our way to start thinking about now we can use these measurements in order to try to see the effect of the intervention. The intervention they are thinking of at the moment is that is a very mechanical intervention. It's basically a, a head support, a, a, head, a collar. Uh, the, different, the problem is that these patients who normally, uh, when, when they, ha they start having uh, problem controlling their neck, they're given this kind of orthosis, which are those that are commercially available, which are meant to be for immobilizing your head. So you can imagine that they're very good at supporting uh, the, the head, but they don't let uh, movement happen in a very uh, natural manner. Plus, they are cumbersome, they're ugly, so these patients are really not, not lacking them. So there is a group in Sheffield that designed this new solution, which is basically a, a much lighter color, which has the trick of having a number of supports that can be attached to it uh, according to the patient need. So if a patient has more or less weakness in their muscles, they can use this support more or less. So the question, so the, the design is, is pretty smart and the patients are liking it. The, the problem is, does it work? I mean, is, is it really doing something or is it just a feeling that the patient has? So we started trying to, to measure first whether this color is actually providing an adequate support comparable to the others and if it's effective for the patients or not. And these are the, the first results. So first of all, we, again, we wanted to, to, to base our protocol on the use of inertial sensors because then we want to go to the clinics and be able to do more measurements on our patients. Of course, we. We had to validate everything that we were doing here using the, the motion capture system in the lab and everything. And I'm not bothering you with that, but it's just to, 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 to tell you that here we're using some, some information about the actual amplitude of the movement measured with those sensors, which normally is something that you shouldn't trust unless it's been validated. <laughs> and again, so uh, I promise that we did the validation, so we proved that this was a safe way to go. And we managed also to prove that already in, in healthy subjects, so in people that are actually able to perform the movements by exploiting all the range of motion and by having accelerations and forces into play that are really challenging the collar, way more than a patient could do. The, the collar, especially if we, when we've used it with all the supports that it can have, is able to, to provide a support, which means basically to limit the range of motion as much as the other collars, but also, the interesting bit for us was that we were able to prove that it was also able to, to uh, restrict the movements only in the direction that we wanted. So if you have a problem in flexing your head, we don't want to block you when you try to, to look around. That would make no sense. So this was very, very encouraging. So next step is to go to the patients and try and test the color to the patients. And this is what we are doing at the moment. So I don't have definite results for that. But it seemed, by using those parameters that we validated at the beginning with the comparison with the healthy patients, we are indeed getting quite, quite good results, quite encouraging results. And especially, we are seeing how the patients that have the major impairments and those that really needed uh, more support are getting a good response out of it. So as I said, this, is a, this was just to give you an, an example of a completely different application where still, the ability to, to measure and monitor without 
having to deal with an entire data analysis system is, is pretty powerful for us. Uh, next bit is, uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the, the work that we are trying to do in, 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 in terms of activity monitoring. Again, we started by, when we started this work, we were just asked to monitor our patients with, this was for patients with type 2 diabetes and multiple sclerosis. I had two different clinicians came to me and said, oh, I want to, mo my, to monitor my patients in daily life. What shall I use? I was like, wow, <laughs> let's think about it. And I just checked the market at the time, and this was what, what was available. I, I was not planning to develop any system or anything. I, I really just wanted to pick the right one. Uh, so I said, okay, let's try them. I mean, most of these are very cheap. You can buy them for, 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 for a few hundred uh, pounds or even less. So we just thought, okay, let's buy, let's buy a few of them and, and try them on. So that's what we did. We asked a few subjects, like, again, okay, these were young, healthy subjects, so it was easy life, uh, to wear all, all the sensors. We followed all the instructions by the, by, the, by the companies. But then, in addition, we used our own gold standard, so we used our more powerful sensors in order to, 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 be, uh, to be able to, to have a reference for those values. And this is what happened. So in this graph, you see the error in terms of of number of uh, uncorrected detection of steps. So we are not interested in timing so complicated things here. We are just really counting the steps. But we, we did it in, in, in real life, so we were not really following our subjects and counting them, but we used this as a reference. And we asked our patients to walk, our subjects to walk at different velocities, different speeds, with the idea that the, the slower they go, the more they might resemble a patient. So, I mean, of course, it's not so simple, but at least it will give us an idea. And you see that, so the blue lines represent the slow walking, and you can see that for some of these sensors, the results were really bad. So we would never use a very, uh, a very cheap one if we want to go with, 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 with patients. So we focused on those that were doing best, the, the, the three that performed better at that time, and, and we decided, and in particular this one, because it, it was the one that, that we had at the moment, and we tried it, we then tried it on patient because we thought, okay, 1%, 2% error, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's, it's life, go with it. But this is what happened when we tried it with patients. This was not real life. This was an empty room. We just asked our, pati our patients to walk around in the empty room without, just without any specific path so that at least it was a bit of a mixed game. And again, this is the error as compared to the results that we obtained in terms of step counting from the sensor, from the inertia sensors on the ankles. And you can see here how an interesting thing started to emerge, that we had quite low errors as soon as our patients were walking at, a, at, a, at an acceptable speed. But whenever we were looking at patients that were walking below a certain threshold, these errors were really big. So the message here is, try it. Don't give your sensor to the patient without having tried it. Because this is what you can get. And if you get a 50% error, it means that you're tossing a coin, basically. Um, good news was that uh, we repeated the experiments one week after, and the error was consistent. <laughs> Which, this is a good news. <laughs> because if you know the enemy, you can, <laughs> you can beat it. <laughs> and, and so, that, that, that's exactly what we're trying to do at the, at the moment. So the idea is at least try to find a method that everybody can use in order to test what they have and make sure that they can then know the inaccuracy of the system and make sure that they interpret the data with, 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 with care. That's the whole point. So first thing was thinking about what is causing those errors. So first thing, the, the most obvious was, okay, all these all the algorithms that are known at the moment have been tested and validated inside the lab, maybe with a few complicated tasks, not even that much, to be honest, but nobody has ever validated them outside the lab. So that's what we started doing. Uh, so we took our subjects, we put them, all the wearable sensors again, these are like those on the trunk, on the pelvis, on the ankles, in order to mimic the different methods. And we gave them also some pressure insoles, which are pretty good at detecting whether someone is, is indeed walking or not. And, and also the timing 
in this case of the, of the walking. Um, so we took the two methods, one, one, we, we compared two methods, one based on the ankle sensors, another one based on the pelvis sensor. And these are the results. So basically we, we noticed that there weren't differences between what we were observing in the lab, both when we asked the patient to walk along a straight line or, it, or when we asked them to walk freely. And the same was when we asked that when they went outside, so when they were walking in the, in the free environment. So again, good news, at least the error is consistent. So in a, as a matter of fact, what we observed in the lab was the exact error that we had outside the lab. Uh, the other thing is that, of course, the, waist, the sensor on the waist was a bit less accurate than the sensor on the ankles, which is something that it's pretty uh, obvious to expect if you measure two ankles very close to where the, the, the step is taking place, it's, it, it, you're likely to have a lower error than when you look at things from the pelvis. But, the good, but interestingly enough, when you combine the error that you make in estimating when your step starts and the error that you, commit, that you make when, in estimating when your step finishes, kind of cancel out in the sense that if we translate that as a percentage of the overall stride time, we obtain a 1% error for both systems. Which is pretty good. Again, one percent error. It's, it's. I wish it was true also for the patients. <laughs> so, but at least now we are confident that whatever we observe in the lab with those methods is quite reliable. Also, when we we let, we let people walking freely outside, so we can really start doing a bit more validation on this as well. Um, and as I said, the sense. The good news is also that the sensor on the waist, which is the most practical, the most commonly adopted. It, is, it seems to be quite, quite robust, and those algorithms seem to be quite robust. Uh, the, so the next step for us in terms of quantifying where, where the error sources can be is that of trying to understand what, is, what are the actual changes that happens when you leave the lab. So can, because again, we all know, we all keep saying your gait changes when you're in free living conditions, but there isn't much information out there of how much does it change, how much it changes. So this is something, again, using those same kind of data, uh, but again, now, now we're working just with wearable sensors. We don't need the pressure insults anymore, and we can, uh, we can uh, look at more patients, because, uh, more participants. We have started looking into this, and we have started, uh, uh, to, again, together with, with Ruth and Lee as well, uh, wondering what, what, where the, uh, what are the changes that, what are the parameters that are more sensitive to these changes? We have really just started, so I don't have many uh, data to show you. This is just an example of how we're looking at those. And honestly, what, what I'm showing here for the step time is something that we are, we are observing for most of the parameters. They're all really behaving the same way. So it's really the, the overall gait pattern is, is, is quite, is changing in, in a quite consistent way. What seems more interesting to me is the fact that uh, there isn't really much of a change by simply, simply because you walk indoor or outdoor. Uh, if you look at the, at, the, at the step time per se, for example, and there isn't even much change when we, another thing that we did was separating the, the most irregular parts of the walking. So when we knew that the person was walking, was turning around, for example, because we had the sensor on the pelvis as well to detect that, uh, from when the person was going more straight. And again, there was, in terms of absolute parameters, there wasn't much difference. We started noticing some changes when we started looking at more uh, interesting, more sophisticated, if you want, parameters, which are really describing the strategy and what's happening a bit more into details. So this is kind of like the way we are going to look into this. But as I said, it's very preliminary. But uh, again, it's reinforcing the concept that is that has been around for a while now, and Brookwood knows very well that it's variability of those parameters that can really bring more information into the game, no matter where it is observed, no matter if it's in the lab or outside. And of course, this is just health individuals, so it's not it's not it will become more interesting by looking at your data, guys, when it's uh, when it's the clinical stuff. So, just to to sum up, I hope I convinced you that at this point we are really. Uh, in the position of measuring and modeling all sorts of movements in every, uh, in, in most sorts of environments, uh, and for the most different applications. What, what I really hope that I, I convince you about as well is that 
you must not trust us. <laughs> no, <laughs> not blindly. <laughs> Be careful when you deal with these things because they, they are too easy. Me measuring is too easy. Making sense of those data is really still a mess. So that's it. So thank you so much for inviting me and let me thanks all these guys here. Uh, and in particular, my PhD students and postdocs who are with this, with the data for this, because they did the job at 20. <laughs> <So. laughs>